All right, so welcome back to the Distortion Principle. Today we're gonna to be talking about Gibson guitars and gonna be kind of going off the cuff here. I think it's gonna be three things. We're gonna talk about the three things, maybe more, maybe less, that Gibson is getting wrong, how they're failing and what they could do to succeed going forward in the modern world. And that kind of already touches on most of it right there. The modern world, right? One of the biggest problems Gibson has right now, as far as I can tell, in my opinion, is with the younger crowd, younger generation, it's it doesn't have that cool factor. It doesn't have the it factor from like, I'm old. Back when I was a kid, everybody had a Gibson. You know, you had James Hetfield with his Explorer. Was the first one even really an Explorer? I don't know. The Flying V of uh, Hammett. Then you had guys like, you know, even Slash. Slash was, but his was a knockoff. You know, <laughs> he had a Gibson. Like everybody in the 80s and 90s, thrash metal guys, blues rock guys, glam rock guys, punk rock guys, everybody was rocking Gibson. So it was kind of like the thing for you to achieve and you couldn't actually afford it. So you bought the Epiphone, but it made you feel like you were there. And if you couldn't buy the Epiphone, you got the even <laughs> lesser knockoff. Anyway, so that was the thing. You were like, oh man, everybody is rocking the Gibsons. I want to rock a Gibson too, because that's how you're going to sound good. You got to play a Gibson guitar. It's not really how you sound good, but that's what you think when you're a kid. So looking at their signature roster, in my mind, I'm trying to think who, who are the most modern players on that roster? I can't think of any. That's the problem. I can't really think of any. I could think of Adam Jones from Tool, but that's from the 90s. Now they have Hammett, they have Dave Mustaine. Those are from the 80s, you know, 83, 85, 81, things like that. Really decades old is all I can think of when it comes to the signature list. And if you look to maybe their Epiphone brand, Epiphone brand is a little bit more modern, but even those guys are at least a decade old. And if you could think of anybody that's more newer than that, please leave a comment down below. I know there's gonna be things out there like Gary Clark Jr. I don't know when he started or Samantha Fish, but I feel like even there, at least a decade old. So if that's not true, please let me know because I don't follow that style of music. But that's blues rock, which is typically for an older crowd, right? So it's like a modern artist, but for an older crowd. And that's the problem. Like kids that are learning to play these days, they're looking to bands like Polyphia, even like the emo thing that's making us a revival. They're, they're, looking, they're looking for brands that are catering to their needs, like Tosin Nabasi's brand, Solar. <laughs> it's weird to say, but you know, these, these YouTuber brands have taken off but in the metal community, a lot of guys in the metal community are looking to ESP, LTD, things like that. So it's like everybody's kind of gravitated to these other brands. And matter of fact, LTD, ESP, LTD has taken some of those signature artists from Gibson and brought it to their roster because take guys like Pepper Keenan and uh, Woody from Corrosion Conformity. They went to LTD because they said their Gibsons wouldn't stay in tune. And Kirk from Crowbar, his, uh, he's Solar now. You know, he left, he played the Gibson Explorer for years. Now he's with Solar. There's Mastodon. Bill went to LTD because they down tuned, but Gibson wouldn't ship out their guitars set up and in tune for the way they play to their audience. And the whole reason was, Bill was like, hey, if somebody's buying a guitar with my name on it, they probably want to play the kind of music I play and actually play like my songs a lot of the time. So they want to be in my tuning. But Gibson wouldn't do it. So they, you know, their whole artist roster thing, the cool factor is just doesn't seem to be there anymore. So that's one of the problems with Gibson. That was a long, long way to get around to say artist roster, right? Cool factor. Next, perceived value. The perceived value you get for the money. Now a Les Paul standard is gonna run you three thousand dollars. You're seeing custom shop models for six, seven, six or seven thousand dollars. And there's a lot of guitar brands that are in that similar price range. But in that price range, you're getting more modern features like stainless steel frets, really good aftermarket pickups, tuners, like they're really going all out. Crazy electronics, ergonomic body shapes, like they're really doing things with their guitars to entice you to buy them. Whereas Gibson's kind of just like putting a finish on another Les Paul, another SG, another Explorer, another Flying V, and just saying, here you go, same old thing again and again and again. The problem with that, right, is problem with that is it's they're catering to an audience but the audience is going to die off because most of the people out there looking for Gibson are people my age or older you see some younger guys doing it too but I feel like I don't have any market research to prove this this is all just opinion in this video so I could be totally off base on all of this but this is how I feel about it um their fan base is older and their fan base is going to die off and they're not, they're not doing anything to entice that modern younger audience they're not going to have the audience, right? It's just going to be Gibson dies off and goes off to the wind and keeps making super expensive guitars for the blues lawyers that happen to want one still. And that's, that's the problem though. Like 
the fan base doesn't want the change. They don't want difference. They don't want anything new because whenever time Gibson tries to do something new, the fan base shuts it down. <laughs> Robot tuners, you know, okay, I get it. Sure, they were a flop, but it was an attempt to try something different. You know, putting robot tuners on a guitar. Cool idea. Never got to use one. People in forums say they suck, but I don't know that personally, but it's something I would like to try because it's a really cool idea just to hit a button and your guitar tunes itself for you. But now in the modern day, we got things like Evertune. So <laughs> it's like an Evertune bridge would do it too without robot tuners. But could you imagine like if the new Les Paul standard came out with an Evertune, stainless steel frets, um, ergonomic body cuts. So like the top of the, the body would be rounded off and then like a tummy cut on the back and then a smoother back of the neck angle for heel joints so you could uh, reach the higher frets and they could take the neck angle and bring it up so it's not so severe so you don't risk breaking them as easily putting stronger wood down the center of the neck so you could have like multi-piece wood necks i mean it'd be a really killer guitar right it'd be a really well-made guitar it would stay in tune it would stay together not break and the fan base would hate it. That's the problem. The fan base would hate it. Like I went to Guitar Center yesterday because I needed new tuners, locking machine heads to put on a guitar. And a kid that worked there, he probably got fired. Like he, he looks like he's new, backed into a, a Gibson Les Paul, or a SG actually, backed into a SG that was sitting on a guitar stand behind the bullpen, knocks it down, breaks the fucking breaks the headstock like it's the stereotypical story you hear about Gibson's and it happened right there in front of me and I was like wow I mean that's that's marketing for you that's marketing not the kind of marketing you want but it's marketing for you so that that's I mean these problems are real problems that Gibson's gonna have to have to address and that brings me to the next point quality there the perception of quality in people's minds is not what it used to be people used to look at Gibson on a wall right they would look at it and be like, oh man, that one day, one day when I'm not working at Walmart, when I'm not working at McDonald's, I'm gonna have that. But now, all the advances made you know, in, in guitar building, CNC machines, all of the, the Asian countries that are making guitars that are doing really good work because they've had a couple decades to get better at it. You know, 30, 40 decades in case of some brands, right? Maybe longer, yeah, they've had a long time in the Asian countries to get good at it. So they're pretty much up to par. When you get Asian made guitars now, you don't feel like, oh man, this is ugh. <laughs> like you used to do back in the day when you bought the pawn shop guitars or the, uh, sorry, not pawn shop, the flea market guitars and the garage sale guitars that were made in Asia, Asian countries. They were made in like Korea or uh, China, things like that. Back then you were like, oh, it just, it felt, it felt cheap. It felt bad. It wouldn't stay in tune. It was horrible. Now you buy them and that is not the case anymore. A lot of times they actually have those higher end features that people are wanting on guitars anyway. So how can Gibson survive going forward? Because at the end of the day, what they do got going for them, beautiful. The guitars are absolutely beautiful. Like I don't care what anybody says. I love Burst Les Pauls, you know. SGs with the, what do they call it? The worn walnut brown finish. Basically it looks like wood, like it looks like a tabletop basically, <laughs> but a pretty tabletop, right? The matte finishes look good because it has that open pour matte finish and they just feel good to play. So overall, Flying V, I mean, who does not like a Flying V? Explore. They just look great. That's the biggest thing they got going from it is they look really, really beautiful. But they got to get to a point where they have to change the perception of the fan base to be like more receptive to new ideas. Because you can go back and look at plenty of new ideas that they've tried in the past that didn't fail. Like I said, the robot tuners, um, putting whammy bars on a uh, Les Paul. All kinds of things they tried. The, the Firebird Zero reverse thing, like that was bad. But they tried things, but they tried things that I guess people aren't wanting. But they got to change that the mindset of the fan base. And by doing that, they need to embrace a different fan base because they have their core fan base that fan base is not going to go away until they die when they die that fan base is gone but the modern fan base is looking for different things they need to do that but when they do it they need to not charge you an extra thousand dollars because they put stainless steel frets on your guitar or an evertune the way gibson can succeed in my opinion is to stop worrying about being a lifestyle brand start worrying about being a guitar brand again altering the perception of people's ideas of what a gibson guitar should and could be altering people's ideas on what the quality of the instrument is. I've had some really good Gibsons and I've had some really horrible. It's kind of hit and miss with the brand, but you could say that probably about any brand, right? But at the end of the day, when I play one, 
I, I enjoy the Mojo. I like the way they, I don't have any currently because the last one I bought was a Explorer that I loved until the pickups went microphonic within a couple weeks of buying it. So I took it back, but I will get another Gibson again, not too far down the future because I love the way they feel. I love the way they smell, but this isn't about me. This is how Gibson can succeed. They need to make these changes. This is a long video. I get it. Sorry. I didn't mean to make this so long. They need to do these things, change the perception of what they should make, change the perception of what their build quality is change the perception and not really change the perception on the cost of the instrument. Make the cost of the instrument uh, reflect on what you're getting. If you wanna charge me $3,000 for a Les Paul standard, make it a standard. Make it the thing that people look to and go, that is a guitar. That is the standard of what a guitar could be because they're not doing it. That was, <laughs> that's what needs to happen right there. If you're gonna release a standard, make it the standard. That's the whole point of this video, right? Make your standard, the standard. Once they do that, it's smooth sailing from there because then they can start doing different new things with guitars. Like, oh, we'll try this, try this because the fan base is there for it. And they know they're getting a quality product. They know that the headstock angle is not gonna be so severe that it's gonna break if somebody knocks it off the stand. I mean, it's just little things. They just, if they could fix these things, you would have an amazing guitar company. Isn't risk of going the way of the dinosaur. I'll see you guys in the next video. Like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. And I hope it doesn't make too many of you mad. I'm just trying to be honest about the brands.